Thanks to everybody for coming. My name is Stephen Naren, and uh, I'm the director of the Fortune Off Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. The Fortune Off Video Archive, um, which began taping testimonies in New Haven back in 1979, contains more than 4,400 testimonies of survivors, uh, witnesses, and bystanders of the Holocaust. It encompasses something like 12,000 hours of recorded material in over a dozen different languages recorded over the last 40 years in over a dozen different countries. Today, uh, in honor of Black History Month, we intend to examine one of those testimonies in the collection, the testimony of an African-American veteran of the Second World War, Leon Bass, uh, who entered the camps shortly after liberation. Uh, we'll be doing this with the help of our speaker this afternoon, Anna Dunsing. Anna is a doctoral candidate in a joint program for History and African-American Studies at Yale University. Her research, writing, and teaching focuses on the United States and the world, specializing in race and empire in modern US history, African-American history, transnational and global history. And her dissertation titled Strange Victory, Cold War Civil Rights in the Long Shadow of Fascism, explores anti-fascist thought and action in the 20th century black freedom struggle, black radical theories of fascism in the United States, and the role of the far right within opposition to the civil rights movement. Today, Anna will be speaking on racism, fascism, and the Jim Crow military as seen through the testimony of Lee on Bass. Anna, we're delighted you're here. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen, for the invitation to give this talk. Um, thanks everybody who unfortunately I cannot see um, who has logged in um, to listen. I realized this morning that it has been exactly one year to the day that I was last in New Haven and, and on campus at Yale. And um, well, I'm sorry we can't all be together in person. And while I recognize the gravity of um, the impending one year milestone of this catastrophic pandemic, I am nonetheless glad to be here with you all. And um, I also welcome anyone who's joining from the greater, you know, beyond, beyond New Haven that is able to, able to join us in this setting. So I'm gonna to try to speak for around 30 minutes and also show around 10 minutes of clips before opening it up to questions and comments. Um, uh, as, as Stephen Naren said, I've built this talk around the story um, and the experiences of an African-American World War II veteran named Leon Bass, whose oral history is housed in the Fortunoff collection. And Bass was among the soldiers who participated in the liberation of Buchenwald, which was just outside the German city of Weimar. And much of his testimony centers around that unexpected and life altering act of eyewitness, but he contextualizes that experience within memories of racial oppression in the United States. Notably what it was like to serve in a segregated army relegated to an all black labor unit when he stepped through the gates of Buchenwald. And after getting out of the army, army Bass became an educator and eventually a high school principal in the Philadelphia area. And you can really see that expertise, that demeanor, the demeanor of a lifelong educator in every aspect of his testimony and his commanding presence, which you'll see is solemn, but also really affable, uh, his storytelling, his powerful and accessible language, but most of all, his steadfast commitment to teach. Um, I'm really trying to honor all of that in this talk. Um, and I'm gonna draw on his testimony, but thread it together with a, with a bigger history um, in order to tell a story about Jim Crow America in the 1930s and 40s, about young soldiers navigating the racism and other indignities of the Jim Crow army. But more so, I want to talk about how African Americans responded to the rise of fascism in Europe, uh, responded to Nazi Germany in particular, and responded to the escalating policies of anti Semitism and violence under that regime. And then Toward the end of the talk, returning to the testimony of Leon Bass, I'll conclude by discussing in brief how African-Americans responded to the Holocaust and how it informed their understanding of ongoing racial violence and white supremacy in the United States, and also set the stakes uh, for the post-war black freedom struggle. And I do wanna note that in this talk, I'm gonna be showing one photograph taken during the liberation of Buchenwald that features the corpses of victims. I'm also going to be showing two political cartoons that depict lynching, um, the victims of lynching in order to critique it. Um, so in September, 1933, mere months after the Nazis had come to power, a foreign correspondent for the Baltimore Afro-American wrote an article weighing in on the public debates 
over the escalating rhetoric and racial policies of the Nazi dictatorship. For the, fast, for the past few months, a controversy on the Jew in Germany has been raging, he wrote, and it was inevitable that the Negro in America should be projected onto it. He was referencing debates in the Paris edition of the Chicago Tribune that juxtaposed the situation of German Jews to those of African Americans in the Jim Crow South. The article meant to intervene in this comparison, differentiating between the black experience of racial oppression in the United States and the status of Jews confronting, in his words, the intensely narrow nationalism and antiquated theories of race promoted by Adolf Hitler. First of all, this journalist argued, Hitlerism appeared to enforce a vastly different social order than US race hate. Nazi Germany lacked the anti-blackness and color lines that crisscrossed every aspect of life back home. In his words, the German Jew was also largely indistinguish in indistinguishable from the so-called Aryan German and black residents, tourists and students moved freely throughout Germany as they did throughout the rest of Europe. In this way, he argued, the persecution on the rise in Germany was not strictly about race, as he understood the term. He noted that the majority of Germans being sent to the newly constructed concentration camps were overwhelmingly socialists and communists. Comparison slips too quickly into competition, he remarked, and the Jim Crow racial regime was a singular monstrosity. However, he admitted, there was no denying that Hitler's talk sounds strikingly like the frothings of a Southern cracker. I want to hone in on this idea of comparisons between Jim Crow and Nazism being inevitable, um, as well as the nature of the particular comparisons, or compare and contrast that this journalist carried out in this very early moment in the Nazi regime. The black press had honed in on the grammar of race and nation undergirding fascism while covering Italy in the decade prior. Hitler's rise to power only fueled the comparative editorial fire, which not only noted shared affinities and agendas and made distinctions in policy, ideology, and national context, but they also tracked cross currents of admiration, imitation, and direct exchange between right-wing state and non-state actors throughout the interwar era. African-American perspectives on fascism and anti-fascist resistance in the 1930s and 40s are a crucial resource for us in the ongoing contemporary debates over fascist analogies and the fascist potential of the United States. This historical archive is rich, offering a cumulative judgment that fascism in power and Europe an exclusionary, nationalistic, militant white race pride in the United States shared common roots, enemies, and ambitions. For many white Americans, fascism initially offered a kind of screen upon which they could project their own anxieties about US social, economic, and race relations. Depending on their politics then, they might celebrate or denounce relative proximity. By contrast, Early African-American assessments of fascist parties, movements, and regimes by both radical intellectuals and in popular discourse, they, this discourse functioned more like an indictment and a warning, not only about what was happening abroad, but also the implications of those developments for their own lives. African-Americans recognized the centrality of racial anti-Semitism to Nazi politics well before their white counterparts and they were quick to frame the fascist embrace of race and nation as nothing new. And indeed, soon enough, many black activists, intellectuals, journalists, and everyday people, including the journalist I quoted at the, at the start of this talk, they arrived at the conclusion that these comparisons and connections were inevitable because Jim Crow and fascism were undeniable bedfellows. In turn, they signaled alarm over what they perceived as dangerous new precedents of racialized citizenship, social control, state violence, and patriotic militarism that would fundamentally transform the world as they knew it. Assessing the historical archive, African-American responses to European fascism and the Holocaust are a mixture, a broad mixture of moral outrage, grassroots movement building, political opportunism, and anxious concern for the future for humanity as a whole. For race conscious African Americans engaged in the growing black public sphere of the 1930s, sensitivity to the race thinking and imperial ambitions undergirding fascist politics threaded together these complex and sometimes contradictory responses. In early 1936, the great poet and major public figure Langston Hughes expressed the sentiment that bound these manifold viewpoints together when he said, Fascism is a new name for that kind of terror the Negro in America has always faced. 
This kind of terrorism is extending more and more to groups of people whose skins are not black. Fascism proved a flexible and highly potent point of reference for African-Americans. They approached fascism as an arsenal, as a powder keg, really, of ideas, cultures, agendas, and tactics rooted in racial colonial violence. These social and political forces to them were already in circulation, already at work in their own communities and in their own histories, yet newly fortified and fanatic in the context of widespread social conflict and global economic collapse. The scholar Michael Rothberg describes this work in the post-war era as multi-directional memory. The idea that historical actors weren't merely comparing events and atrocities in a competitive struggle for recognition, but rather as a way to understand their worlds and better articulate their own experiences of racial violence and state oppression. Black theories of and responses to fascism in the 1930s and 40s began from a place of relational political engagement with Europe but argued that Europe was not the sole entry point for understanding and combating fascism. This discourse tended to follow a calculus of family resemblance, wary of fascism's capacity to travel and adapt to diverse national contexts. And here, I think, is a good example of the kind of comparative relational work that I'm describing, a rhetorical move that was really common across uh, the interwar and wartime eras. On the left, um, you can see an anonymous woman slain by the Nazis with reference to the Warsaw Ghetto. And on the right, you see the body of Cleo Wright, who was lynched by a white mob in Sykeston, Missouri in early 1942 after assaulting a white woman in her home. And this lynching had garnered international attention because it was the first to occur after the United States had entered the war. And because of this added pressure of the global eye, it was also the first case of lynching taken up by the US Department of Justice. The same day that this cartoon ran, however, the black newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier published another compare and contrast piece by a white liberal that argued the difference between Nazi terror and Jim Crow persecution was less in kind and more in terms of historical, the historical direction of each social order. So in, in the words of this writer, Hitler has crassly reversed the clock of civilization, whereas we in America have been moving slowly toward more tolerance. These debates um, in the black press, in the black public sphere were not preoccupied with taxonomy, but rather with the vicissitudes of the worlds in which African-Americans lived, viewed against the backdrop of dicta dictatorship, total war and genocide in Europe. They show a complex combination of sympathy and self-interest. They often sought to highlight American hypocrisy and frame Jim Crow as a backwards anti-democratic system. They aim to expose the very real models that the Italian fascists had in the European scramble for Africa or the Nazis had in US settler colonialism and the Jim Crow South. In response to the passage of the Nuremberg laws in 1935, for instance, one journalist wondered, what are Jim Crow's laws but fascist laws. Likely unaware of the extended efforts that Nazi lawyers had taken to survey US racial legislation, he ventured, it is difficult to believe that Hitler, to save time, did not copy them directly from the Southern statutes and from the unwritten laws of America against Negroes. In other moments, this connective work manifested as grassroots global solidarity, reformulating one group's freedom struggle toward a more universal politics as was the case with the global Black-led mass movement that rose in response to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. In other moments in public discourse on fascism, African-Americans arrived at the idea that there was a unique form of US fascism born of racial slavery and its many legacies. Um, this was often called our native brand of fascism. And this brand came in forms as varied as lynch mobs, the Klan, the police, strike breaking, union busting, and other attacks on labor. The South, as you can imagine, very often took center stage, but their assessments also acknowledged the United States as a whole with its faulty democracy and increasingly domineering presence on the world stage. Black anti-fascist discourse and, and activism did show a growing concern over Nazi sympathizers and actual fascist movements in the interwar United States, but the critique was much more often centered on the insistence centered on critiquing that insistence on gradualism you heard in the article. I quoted, the idea that the country was moving slowly toward more tolerance. 
And the response to that in light of what was happening in Europe, in light of uh, everyone's feeling that things were about to get much worse, the response was gradualism isn't enough. Um, and you can see a bit of that attitude um, in this cartoon, which was published two weeks after uh, Kristallnacht. And um, this cartoon ran with the accompanying editorial, Colored America is also shocked, but there are some things that Colored America cannot understand about white America's reaction to the atrocities. What they could not understand was humanitarian support and widespread con condemnation without self-reflection on the United States' own history and present realities. The article went on, how could you be shocked over ransacking when the United States had, quote, robbed Indians of a whole continent? How could you be shocked over these killings when 5,000 lynchings were on record? How could you be shocked over racial pollution laws when similar legislation ordered American society? With the onset of war, and especially with the US ent entrance into the conflict in late 1941, this argument gained a great deal of political power. The United States was not yet a fascist state within black anti-fascist analysis, but the pervasive presence of domestic Hitlerism, as they often called it, put it in complicit dynamic relationship to the regimes of Italy, Germany, and Spain, as well as those of European colonial rule. This stance disputed the framing of the conflict of, of World War II as one of democracy versus fascism, freedom versus tyranny, good versus evil. It challenged the idea uh, that the US racial order was an acceptable system, emphasizing its hypocrisy, its vulgarity, and its inhumanity. And this argument found its clearest expression in the Double V campaign, which was first championed by the Pittsburgh Courier and called for victory over aggression, slavery, and tyranny, both abroad and at home. And in many cases, it was clear, it was made clear that this meant double victories against fascism, the American variety, as well as the European brand, as one writer put it. And it's my sense that at this point, it's really no longer about compare and contrast. Many many simply couldn't understand fascism as an entirely foreign concept. The lines were far too murky. And it wasn't this clear, you know, fascism was not this clear opposite or sort of other of American democracy, but much more like a, a doppelganger. And at times, of course, invocations of Hitlerism did function as a simple shorthand or signifier or insult. But the idea of a unique American fascism had really taken hold. Um, and it got to the heart of a lived experience of racialized rightlessness within a liberal democracy. And the scholars Bill Mullen and Christopher Biles recently um, expressed this idea really well. They wrote, for people of color at various historical moments, the experience of racialization within a liberal democracy could have the valence of fascism. That is to say, while a fascist state and a white supremacist democracy have very different mechanisms of power, the experience of racialized rightlessness within a liberal democracy can make the distinction between it and fascism murky at the level of lived experience. For those racially cast aside outside of liberal democracy's system of rights, the word fascism does not always conjure up a distant and alien social order. The idea of an incipient American fascism as expressed through the Double V campaign, raised the stakes of what would happen if they failed to succeed on both fronts. Um, as one editorial from the Chicago Defender put it in 1942, all of Negro America is revolted at the monstrous atrocities Hitler is heaping upon the Jewish people. We who are Negroes know that if Hitler wins, we too will be the victims of slaughter of even greater magnitude. If Hitler wins, the poll taxers of the South who now use lynching as a weapon of terror we use it as a weapon of extermination. And as you can see from these images um, on the screen, Double V was also rooted in patriotism and win the war gusto. And it helped inspire and cohere the official logic of patriotic anti-fascism so central to the American war effort. Wartime civil rights efforts really marked a point of no return for federal policies, federal support of racial liberalism it's the moment you really start to see a sea change regarding uh, federal support of policies of racial integration. And civil rights activism during the war also pushed many white Americans to, to really confront issues of racial inequality in significant ways, giving rise to new standards of tolerance, 
and new terms of acceptable language and behavior. And it's in this moment that Leon Bass enlisted. Uh, Bass was born and raised in Philadelphia. He grew up in predominantly uh, black neighborhoods, went to mostly all black schools and his parents who were former sharecroppers from South Carolina, they, they kept him, they seem to have kept him very sheltered about the, the full force and structural violence of Jim Crow and racial violence in the United States. However, that all changed when he, uh, when he joined up. 20 years old by the time the Second World War had become a reality? No, I was, I, and I finished school in 1943 and I was 18. And that's when I became part of the military. And you, how did you become part of the military? Did you volunteer or drafted? Yes, I, I went out and I, I volunteered and I was to go out with the next group. And when I went down to the induction center, institutional racism smacked me right in the face because the sergeant was there and he told me to go one way when I went through the door and he told my white friends to go another way because my country practices, promulgated, promoted institutional racism. And the military was one of the largest to do just that. And so I went into an all black unit save for the officers, they were white. But uh, all of the, my comrades in arms at the time were, were black. Bass was promptly sent down south for basic training. Eight of the nine largest army training camps were located in the south. So this was a common experience for black GIs. And that also meant the majority of white officers overseeing their training came, came from the south as well. And Bass found his time in basic training extremely demeaning and disaffecting, not only for the daily degradations of Jim Crow, but also for being relegated to a, a labor unit. Was it your perception, though, that the black troops generally, though, uh, fully understood the fact that uh, while the rhetoric of the war against Nazi racism and so mm -hmm. forth was, was fine, uh, in practice, the country was doing something entirely different. Oh, yes. It was as though you were schizophrenic. <laughs> Our country had, was two personalities, you know. In one way, we may make the wonderful pronouncements, you know. We, we talk about our Judeo-Christian ethics and uh, we're going to make the world a better place for democracy and all that other jazz. But then when you cut down to the real thing and you start seeing the way they operate, uh, you know, things were not, they were not in consonance. And so I began to be an angry, frustrated, young black soldier. At this time, I wanted to get out of the army. I'll be very honest with you. After my experiences, I really did not want to be in this man's army. And uh, especially after having to stand on a bus when there were no seats at the back, having to stand up for 100 miles looking at empty seats. Yeah, that didn't endear me to, to my country. Um, couldn't eat in a restaurant. I had to go around the back and knock on the door to get food. And, and I'm in a uniform. I, and I saw PWs, prisoners of war from Germany, being allowed to go in a restaurant and sit down to eat. And yet I was not entitled to for that same opportunity. Yeah. Bass shipped out for Europe in October 1944 as part of the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion of the US Third Army. Soon they arrived in Belgium, fought in the Battle of the Bulge, which was the last major German offensive campaign of the Western Front. And as laborers, soldiers like Bass were, on, were really first on the front lines and often last to leave. They built roads and bridges, they loaded munitions and supplies, they disabled landmines, they transported the wounded and they tended to the dead. Uh, they crossed into Germany in March of 1945 and by April they had reached the east central German city of Weimar. Just to the north uh, in the hills above the city of Weimar sat Buchenwald. The SS opened the camp in 1937, primarily for political prisoners, but they were soon joined by Jews, Roma, Jehovah's Witnesses, military deserters, prisoners of war and other groups. Between July 1937 and April 1945, it is estimated the SS imprisoned some 250,000 people there. Buchenwald was one of 44,000 camp ghettos and incarceration sites operated by Nazi Germany and its allies across Europe between 1933 and 1945. 
And the process of camp liberation itself was a chaotic affair. With US forces fast approaching, the Germans had attempted to evacuate some 30,000 prisoners, roughly a third of whom they killed or died in the process. In the meantime, an underground resistance network within the camp stormed the watchtowers and seized control in anticipation of the approaching Americans who arrived that afternoon and found 21,000 people there. In Bass's words. We, we went to Weimar and set up our bivouac area and then went immediately with an officer, about five of us. We were in the intelligence reconnaissance section of our unit and we went right to Buchenwald. And that was the day that I was to discover what had really been going on in Europe under the Nazis. Because I walked through the gates and I saw walking dead people. Seriously, walking dead people. I am not a doctor. I cannot assess things that accurately, but in just looking at these people who were skin and bone and dressed in those pajama type uniforms, their heads clean shaved and, and filled with sores due to malnutrition. And here they were coming towards us, making all kinds of guttural statements and using their own language. And it was very difficult for me to comprehend what was going on. I just looked at this in amazement and, and I said to myself, you know, my God, you know, who are these people? What have they done? What was their crime? You know, it's hard for me to try to understand why anybody could have been treated this way. I don't care what they had done. It just didn't grab me. And I didn't have any way of thinking uh, or putting a handle on it. No frame of reference. I was only 20. And here you can see the moment that Bass was just describing. Um, he only spent one day at Buchenwald, a matter of hours, really. But the experience fixed itself permanently in the back of his mind, although for many years, decades, really, he, he never spoke of it. And he remained stationed in Germany long enough to watch massive swastikas demolished off of government buildings in the city of Nuremberg before he was shipped to the Philippines, where he served for another eight months. Now, VE Day in early May 1945 was jubilant, but as of May 1945, color lines snaked across every aspect of American life. White mobs, vigilante groups, and innumerable, innumerable iterations of local, state, and federal officials policed these lines as they saw fit. Jim Crow lawmakers vowed to defend the social and political order at whatever cost. Even blood banks remained segregated a holdout of popular racial science so egregious, so glaringly parallel to Nazi race law that it became one of the most heated civil rights issues of the war years. Articles and man on the street interviews published in the black press in the immediate wake of VE Day indicate that Germany's total surrender prompted questions about whether fascism had really been defeated, whether it could ever be defeated within Western capitalist societies, and about whether white Americans were poised to learn anything from fascism's, fascism's reign and apparent ruin. As one factory worker told her interviewer, if the whites haven't learned by now, I guess they never will. And here you can see two political cartoons from the summer of 1945 grappling with um, clear, obvious um, signs of anti-blackness and racism um, continuing uh, as the war came to a close. Um, and as the war came to a close and really in, in the months that followed, racial violence did surge throughout the United States, right? Mobs of white vigilantes were targeting returning black veterans. Um, you saw this deliberate stripping away of wartime gains through a sub Southern mobilization in defense of Jim Crow. Um, in the summer of 1945 in Congress, lawmakers staged fierce campaigns on the floor of, of the Senate, arguing against fair employment legislation and fought viciously against widely supported efforts to eliminate the poll tax and pass federal anti-lynching legislation. And there's one really remarkable article from that summer 
in which a black columnist named Marjorie McKenzie observed that all of this racist and really explicitly racist and explicitly anti-Semitic filibustering that was happening at the Capitol garnered new meaning when you recognize that just a, a block away, mere steps away at the Library of Congress, they had opened an exhibit of mural sized atrocity photos. So these are scenes from, from concentration camp liberation. And thinking about that juxtaposition, Mackenzie wrote, it has, said, it has been said that it is a good thing for Americans to see the horrors of the German concentration camps because seeing them will make us resolve never to allow anything like that to happen here. But Mackenzie doubted such an assertion. The military collapse of fascism is going to leave the world a heritage of fascists without labels, she wrote. To defeat the organized strength of a system of government without destroying the ideology upon which it is based is dangerous. And her argument uh, really returns to this, this theme I already mentioned. Her argument came down to the murkiness of you know, the, the lack of demarcation line, the instability of the demarcation line and the vigilance that would be required to determine where one form of politics began and, and one, or one, where one ended and, and one began, right? And making that determination before it was too late. And for some claims of American fascism, a kind of unique form of American fascism, they were largely rhetorical. They were a provocative way to tie foreign affairs to domestic issues and draw attention to the civil rights cause. For others, however, the threat of US fascism was plausible and rather urgent. And for many, I think it was some combination of those two feelings, uh, some strategy and some dread. And either way, they were rooted in understanding that white Americans refused to actually interrogate their history, their complicity, their insistence on reform rather than reconstruction. An early post-war commentary in the black press uh, that focused on the afterlife of fascism, the idea that Hitler had been defeated, but his ideas had not. The realities and residue of those ideas, they, they argued they were still palpable in American life. And they included racial chauvinism and nativist sensibility, exclusionary nationalism defined through legal claims to whiteness, lost cause nostalgia and fantasies of white victimhood, a militant and deputized citizenry, citizenry um, the mass caging of internal and external enemies in reservations, ghettos, and detention centers and prisons. And after 1945, reckoning with all of this, African Americans called for justice. They called for reflection, but really clearly they called for vigilance, for they recognized that there was a danger that fascism was still pending um, in a world that had already shown that they, it wasn't going to come to terms with, with what it had just done. And for Bass, it would take him some time to, to, to put these connections together. Um, upon his return home, he sort of set to make a life for himself. He started a family, he got his PhD, he built his career and he became involved with the civil rights movement. Uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968 had a profound impact on him. And in his testimony, he describes the heartache and horror that he felt in, in the wake of that event. And this was a personal grief and disillusionment for him personally, but it was something he saw reflected black back tenfold in the young you know, black and brown students um, at the high school where he served as principal. So it was around this time, sort of late 60s, right around 1970 in particular, that he started to think about Buchenwald again. And one day I came to a classroom and in that classroom there was a lady and she was trying to talk to the young men who were not listening to her. You know, they were doing everything but listening. And I stood at the door and I began to realize that she was a survivor. And she had survived one of the worst camps. She had survived Auschwitz. And she was here today on this particular day to share her experience, her pain, if you will. And these young men were not listening. They had their own pain, you know, and, and I understood that, you know, the pain of rejection, the pain of not giving, being given the kind of recognition you deserve. I understood all of that. I had been through there and I knew their pain, but I also knew her pain. And so I had to say to them, hold it, fellas, cool it. 
listen, what she says is true, I was there. And so they got quiet for a while. And once she started telling her account of, of what happened at Auschwitz, they really listened. And she told them how she lost her grandmother, grandfather, her parents, brothers, sisters, cousins, all those near and dear who had come into that camp. All of them had gone to the gas chambers and had ended up in the ovens. And of her family, she was the only one that came out of there. And they listened. She shared with them so much. And they asked her questions, which made me know that she had to reach them. And they came up and looked at the numbers tattooed on her arm, and they thanked her. And they did something I hadn't been done in a long while. They left that room in silence. And of course, she turned to me, and of course, tears were coming down her face. And she thanked me for my intervention and, <laughs> and wanted to know more about my experience at Buchenwald. And I began to remember. Bassa's own experiences with the exclusionary racial order of the United States and in later years, his awareness of the inequalities that shaped the world of his students coming of age in the late 60s, all this became the lens through which he came to process what he saw at Buchenwald. He realized that the camp was not a singular place in his words, but rather evinced a culmination to white supremacy, the face of evil, he called it, racism, anti-Semitism, bigotry, prejudice, and all manner of hatred. Bass concluded that Jim Crow and fascism did stem from the same roots. And like many before him, he felt that the problem was that the United States had largely failed in the necessary project of probing those roots, those that cut deep across Europe and its colonies, as well as those that stretched in hardened networks through its own rich and bloody soil. And look what it did to us. Uh, racism has just about split us so many different ways till we can't live in harmony with one another. Suspicious. Uh, all of this I discovered uh, at a, as an adult. And I didn't get it when I was young, when I should have had it, because people didn't want to deal with it. It was an ugly side of our history and ugly things we want to push under the rug. We don't want to deal with it. And I'm saying to people today, you must face it. You can't laundry and sanitize our history. You must take history with its beauty and you must take it with its degradation. You, you've got to deal with it. For us to be whole human beings and, and, and to make a difference. And this is especially true with young people. And so I go around telling my story. And of course, I, you know, I get the people saying, Leon, what are you dealing with this? This is, this is not a black problem. Why? I said, hey, it's not a black problem. It's not a white problem. It's a human problem. And we've got to face it. And as Dr. King says, injustice anywhere is a loss of justice everywhere, you see. Words to that effect. And it's true. What affects you affects me. Your pain has to be my pain, and my pain has to be your pain. And I must somehow convey that to the young people that I come to. I, it's my commitment. And somebody says, uh, you, you, why do you deal with that mess? You know, I, I said, I'm sorry. I know it's been 40-some years, but that doesn't make it go away. It only makes us become more aware that we today have to do something that, to stop that which created the final solution. And that something is racism. Really, racism is at the root of all of this. Under that umbrella comes bigotry and prejudice and discrimination, and unemployment, people who are unemployable, uh, large institutions filled with those who are drug addicts and those who are criminals, all because somehow we have come to grips with that institution of call racism. And we have to because we see the ultimate of racism, which was what I saw at Buchenwald. And so what do we do? Do we as educators, and, and I use it in the broadest sense because we're all teachers of the young, uh, in our way of life, do we convey to them the best that we can be, or do we give them the worst side that we have? Do we promote racism through our apathy? When we hear and see things, we say nothing because we don't want to jeopardize that which is important to us, our investment in a job, our, our investment among friends. We don't want to disturb our families, so 
no matter what people say or do, uh, just leave it alone, sweep it under the rug, and somehow it'll go away. But the skinheads are with us. The Klan is with us. They may be dressed in Brooks Brothers suit with attaché cases. They may be in, uh, in doctors. They may be lawyers. They may be the guy who drives a bus, but they're still with us. And just to conclude, uh, the steady advance and nationwide embrace of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s did confirm that the fascistic filibustering of Mississippi senators had been their swan song after all. These decades saw a substantial decline in the excessive mob rule and public expressions of racism, public acts of racism and white supremacy so pervasive in the age before. Yet as Bass put so well, many of the currents of, of white supremacy, but also the, the vast structures of race and class inequality in the United States are still with us. And a significant part of the problem are Americans who choose every day to buy into a myth that a myth of the United States that for many people does not exist. Um, White people were and are astounded by the Holocaust in Germany, wrote James Baldwin in 1962. They did not know that they could act that way, but I very much doubt whether black people were astounded at least in the same way. In signaling a heritage of fascists without labels in the United States, African-American voices in the 1930s and 40s laid the groundwork for a long-term challenge to the patriotic anti-fascism and narrow myths of progress, which whitewashed national memory in the post-war United States. They helped to forge an anti-racist, anti-fascist counter heritage and radical organizing tradition with tremendous coalition building possibilities, not only across the civil rights era and the age of black power, but also up into our present moment. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, we have a little bit of time for uh, questions. So if anyone uh, would like to ask Anna a question, you can use the Q&A button uh, or the chat. Uh, I'll field both of those. We do have one question already. Uh, and this is a question about the economic system. And um, the question is, uh, is capitalism to fascism as socialism is to communism? Is our economic system one reason it is so difficult for us to recognize who we are? It's a big question, but to the heart of it, is our economic is is our economic system or economics somehow tied up with why we can't um, we can't seem to come to terms with uh, racial inequality? To a very uh, to a very big question, I'll I I, I will offer a, a brief answer, which is. Yes, <laughs> right, and and learning from the you know the the you know black radical theorists who were writing explicitly about this um, over a hundred years ago, right? They would say that the the entire formation of of the American economic system was on the basis of chattel slavery and and plantation economics, right? So they would say the two were entirely caught up together, and anti blackness and racial formation was part of the maintenance of capital and was the sort of justification for capitalist accumulation and expansion and extraction of goods and colonies, right? So the simple answer is yes. Um, I think I think they are entirely tied up together. Thanks. All right. Uh, Gil has a question here, fairly long. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and read it because I think it's worth reading uh, in its entirety. Um, so Gil found it fascinating that you highlight how Black American commentators understood European fascism as centered on racism rather than about authoritarian forms of government as it has been recently discussed here in the US. And he thinks that's an extremely important perspective. Um, you talk mainly about perceptions of resemblance between European fascism and the US, but I wonder if you can talk a bit about the history of actual legal relationship and influence. Just two examples to prompt discussion would be James Whitman's book, Hitler's American Model, um, and, uh, and the relationship between uh, Nazi race policy and Jim Crow. You talked a little bit about that in your talk. Um, and there's another, uh, I think uh, Robenbach, I believe, has an article about how African-American intellectuals tried to draw on the new post-war concept of genocide coined by Raphael Lemkin during the Holocaust, um, after the Holocaust to, to fight lynching in the South and how it became intertwined with, uh, with, continuing your point, Soviet depictions of the U.S. as a fascist state. 
Yeah, but those are, yeah, those are great questions. And definitely like the undercurrents of this talk and things that I sort of had to cut in order to make this to fit the time. So um, first of all, right, that's a little bit what I was trying to get at, right? That as early as like literally before the March on Rome in 1922, um, the black press is sort of having debates like, are the fascists like Klansmen? And oftentimes they would say no, because the Klansmen, the fascists are a little more dignified, right? They're sort of, you know, but, but those, there was this feeling early on that was about, you know, this compare and contrast that was pretty abstract, that was about, you know, parallels, similarities, echoes, but also from the beginning, they were looking at moments of direct exchange and alliances, right? So it's, it was something like just a few months after the fascists in Italy came to power, uh, uh, a leader in the Ku Klux Klan announced that he wanted to forge an alliance with them in order to bring the Klan struggle for white supremacy to Europe, right? So you, so you do have direct admiration, borrowing and exchange. Um, you also of course have massive routes of, of, of interaction in the field of eugenics. Um, you know, I think there's a very famous comment where some American eugenicists said that the Nazis are beating us at our own game. And of course you have the research that, that James Whitman's book um, put, put so well, right? That, that the, the, the Nazi government did study the kind of elaborate systems of American race law to try to figure out what did and did not work. And we're actually quite perturbed. I mean, recognize that um, many things wouldn't work in the context of Nazi Germany, but learned a lot specifically about um, Anti, anti sort of racial terms of citizenship. So, so the Nazis also learned a lot from the Johnson Reed Act, the very restrictive immigration law passed in the United States in 1924 um, and also miscegenation laws, right? Um, so, so you do have these moments of direct exchange which I think are also fascinating because the archive is just full of, of people tracking the parallels on both levels, right? On the kind of more abstract level of parallel agendas and on actual routes of exchange. And really quickly to your second question, I mean, that's, that to me is, is such a key component sort of in the, in the wave of sort of in the immediate post-war moment, there are actually three different petitions submitted by African-Americans to the UN um, on, be, on behalf. So the first one by a group called the National Negro Congress in 1946 um, that was calling for an end to discrimination. The second one by the NAACP in 1947 to the kind of coming together human rights um, convention. And then the last one was in 1951 by the Civil Rights Congress, specifically demanding the United States be charged with genocide. And I think everyone should read that petition, We Charge Genocide. It's extensive. It's 240 pages. But, but it shows a very keen, really brilliant, really sharp, but no less provocative interpretation of the, of the actual legal crime of genocide. Actually, Raphael Lemkin disapproved of the petition, but I think that story really, you have to understand it in the context of the Cold War. And even to see how much the, Amer the, the American public widely praised um, the, 40, the 46 and 47 petitions, but by 1951 condemned it across the board, right? And, and it's significant that, that, that the National Negro Congress in 1946 and the Civil Rights Congress in 1951 were both directly affiliated with the Communist Party, right? And that is the kind of other undercurrent of this whole talk, um, we're, you know, the, 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 we're talking about the heyday of radical interracial trade unionism and communist organizing in the United States. But again, what I think is so fascinating about this archive is it just explodes past that pretty quickly. And, and I think what's really significant is after the Hitler-Stalin pact, you know, which was such a huge blow to the left, the language of anti-fascism lived on, right? It really continued to be a popular vernacular um, related to, but also unmoored from the kind of political and ideological commitments of, of the Communist International. Yeah, great question. No, I mean, great, great answer. So um, we just have a couple more questions and then um, I think we'll, we'll start to wrap things up. This is also another big question, but I think the talk, uh, it's clear that the talk would bring a question like this up. Um, it seems as, there, as if there should be great empathy and understanding between the American Jewish community and the African American community. Um, how would you explain, though, then, that there is such times of, of moments of such animosity and conflict between these two groups um, uh, in the past and in, in the present? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question, and I think um, 
we can we go over can we go i don't want can we go past sure okay i don't yeah i don't i don't want to have to like rush these things because it seems very serious um so i mean i think that's actually reason enough to just go and sit and watch leon bass's full testimony because what exists underneath the surface of his whole um his whole oral history is that the interview was conducted in 1988 which I think was this particularly heated moment of tension and, um, you know, eventually with the Crown Heights riots, sort of outright um, <laughs> violent clashing between um, Black Americans and Jewish Americans, right? And um, I mean, I think my interest in this archive and, and all of these calls for solidarity and all these calls for sort of building a movement and alliance in the interwar period was in was sort of in pursuit of a larger story than what I had heard um, for many years of my education, right? Of, of these tensions of the pervasiveness of um, anti-Black racism amongst Jews and anti-Semitism amongst African-Americans. Sometimes in the archive, you do find um, uh, people writing editorials in the Black press, right? S saying like, we have to stop this, right? Sort of condemning um, the explicit anti-Semitism of groups, right? And, and a lot of that was sort of rooted in local, I think, either sort of in the case of, of, of particular cities like New York, um, local issues, local tensions. Um, but I think an example I really like, so that, that book I mentioned, and this is someone else asked about um, book recommendations. And one of the ones I'll mention, which I think has such a beautiful example to think about this, um, Michael Rothberg, who wrote this great book called Multidirectional Memory. It's his attempt to try to understand how it's sort of less, looking at Holocaust memory, decolonization, and civil rights movements at events that happened at the same time, what are the moments of collaboration and cross-referencing rather than competition? And his explanation for, at least in the United States, why the competition um, happens is he uses the example, he was writing a book when they were getting ready to open the National uh, Museum of African American History on the National Mall. A lot of people were struck by the sort of symbol that um, that museum was taking up the literal last plot right, of the National Mall. Um, and he says, you know, for, for racialized groups in the United States, for minorities in the United States, for groups who are subject to racial persecution and prejudice in the United States, there's often a feeling that there is a limit to the amount of tension and the amount of recognition that they can get, right? So there's like a competition, competition a la real estate for who can be represented, who can be protected, um, who can receive dignity. Um, and, and his argument is essentially, right, um, that, that, justice and solidarity and the pursuit of human dignity should not be like real estate, right? That it should be rooted in um, collaboration. So I think my research, I've, I've just been over the years been so struck by how many other um, conversations were happening, but I think it is significant and it's important to recognize um, the violence and, and contention as well. And I think someone else had a book. I think another, if you want to like, what was, do you want to get the specific book recommendations? It's so funny, I'm like surrounded by the books <laughs> I used to write this talk. I mean, I think to me, like an amazing classic place to start, truly the book that got me into all of this is um, Glenda Gilmore, uh, Yale professor Glenda Gilmore's Defying Dixie. Um, not only is it just um, an incredible extensive history, she's also just such a beautiful writer and a brilliant scholar. Um, so I really strongly recommend this. And then, um, Two more <laughs> that I just have all around me. Um, one is um, Susan Pennybaker's From Scottsboro to Munich, um, which looks more at the Black diaspora and concentrates in Great Britain. And then finally, this just came out and this was the book I quoted from um, the US Anti-Fascism Reader. It's a really amazing, um, re very recent collection of all sorts of different political perspectives, all sorts of different arguments, all sorts of different assessments. Um, from the 1920s up through the present. Great. Um, I dropped a couple of links uh, to, to those titles um, uh, as well in the chat, um, but you're welcome to get in touch uh, with me. My email's on the website and I can, um, I can provide you with uh, more information about those readings if you'd like. Um, if there aren't any 
other questions, then uh, I'd like to extend my thanks again to Anna for some really enlightening presentation. Uh, and a thank you to everyone who came today uh, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you all so much. And you're welcome to, to send me an email if you wanna, if you have questions or wanna chat.